ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Atlantic Canada launch of the Science Media Centre of Canada and the launch of the Science and its Public's multi-part national lecture series hosted by Situating Science and the Canada Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs. My name is Chris Hornberger. I'm a partner with uh, Halifax Global and we're a management consulting firm here in Halifax. And uh, it's been our pleasure to be involved with the Science Media Centre since the time it was uh, at its embryonic stages and uh, just a sparkle in somebody's vision. And I'll introduce you to those somebodies in a few minutes as we move through our evening. Uh, it has really been quite, uh, quite amazing to watch how the Science Media Centre has evolved over the last couple of years when uh, I and my colleagues uh, first did a feasibility study and then a business plan to, uh, to launch or at least hope to launch the Science Media Centre of Canada. The official launch of the Science Media Centre of Canada was held in Ottawa about a year ago and there have been some regional launches since that time, particularly in um, Toronto, Victoria and Montreal. So this is uh, the fourth regional event and I'm sure the largest of all of them. The best attended and I've been trying to tell the folks from, Eastern, or from Western Canada or from Central Canada that we aren't at all competitive out here. <laughs> so, uh, so it is my pleasure to welcome you, all of you here today. Uh, this fourth event really began to gel as, uh, as we uh, ran into our collaborators. And I say ran into uh, uh, with a sort of tongue-in-cheek because <laughs> we, uh, we were attempting to bring folks together to, to uh, begin to organize an event such as this and a launch for the Science Media Center. And lo and behold, uh, one day at one of uh, my meetings, uh, Chris Stover and uh, Gordon McEwitt uh, who sit over here on my left, uh, arrived. And Gordon is with Situating Science and Chris is with the uh, Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs. And, uh, and they were interested in collaborating and I'm so pleased to see that this collaboration has truly worked out well. Uh, to quickly run through our agenda for this evening, you'll hear next from Chris Stover, who will tell you a little bit about the lecture series. And then you'll hear from Penny Park, who is the Executive Director of the Science Media Centre of Canada. And that's before we get into the main part of the evening. So they've been tasked with being brief. Uh, because we know we're all here to hear from the folks here on my right. Uh, the panel discussion is scheduled to take place for about an hour and 10 minutes. And that will include both presentations from our panelists and discussion from the floor. Um, and, uh, and following the panel discussion, I'm going to invite Suzanne Corbet, who is uh, a, a very esteemed member of the Science Media Center community um, and the, as the founding chair of the board um, and one of the visionaries that I spoke about. And she'll briefly talk to us about the importance of partnerships for the Science Media Center to be successful. So it'll be a wrap by about 9 o'clock. So with that, I'd like to invite Chris Stover, to, who's the general manager of the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs, to give you a brief, brief overview of the national lecture series. Chris? Well, as she mentioned, good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Stover, the general manager of the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs, or SACEPA, you may know us as, which is a joint initiative of the Atlantic School of Theology and St. Mary's University. I'd like to welcome you here tonight on behalf of our board and our executive director, Dr. Sheila Brown, and our collaborating partner, the Situating Science Knowledge Cluster, which is headed up by Dr. Gordon McEwitt here at King's. And as you heard from Chris, two things are happening here tonight, the launch of the Science Media Centre of Canada, as well as the launch of the Science and its Publics National Lecture Series, which is co-created by SACEPA and Situating Science. Our two groups are very pleased to offer Science Media this platform for the launch in Atlantic Canada, as our mandates all dovetail so well together. SACEPA so provides an arena for critical thinking, public discussion, and research into current ethical challenges in our society. And ethics in public affairs is about how the values of individuals and organizations interact and evolve to enable us to live and work together more effectively. The Situating Science Knowledge Cluster is a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada funded project promoting communication and collaboration among humanists and social scientists engaged in the study of science and technology. So the Science and its Public's National Lecture Series, which aims to encompass both those mandates, begins here 
with our presentation this evening. It's a multi-part series which will examine the role of the public in the translation and understanding of the knowledge of science. And we'll do this by hosting presentations in a few other Canadian cities, which include Montreal and Toronto, Ottawa, Saskatoon, Edmonton, and Calgary. An outline of the full details of the series can be found on the SACEPA and Situating Science websites, as well as on the information table directly outside this auditorium. Please have a peek at those materials assembled for more information about what all our groups are up to in the coming months. The series moves next to Montreal, where Dr. Jan Galinsky from the University of New Hampshire will give a talk entitled Frankenstein in the Public Sphere, Science and the Virtue of Sociability, and he'll draw attention to the dangers that could arise should science attempt to harness the powers of nature where moral imperatives are ignored. In Toronto in the spring, the University of Toronto will play host to a presentation examining research into the controversy surrounding the treatment for MS. We're back in Halifax in March, where Dr. David Pantaloni of the University of Ottawa will discuss the role of Providence and the public museum and the dramatic and ethical dilemmas that exist in the realm of how science is understood by the public when life stories and histories of the artifacts and objects are examined. This talk will also be reprised in Ottawa. Also in March, Dr. Margaret Locke of McGill University will travel to the West and present talks, three talks, on facing uncertainty, who is destined for Alzheimer's disease. Wrapping up the National Lecture Series, Dr. Locke will speak in Saskatoon, Edmonton, and Calgary on this topic. It's our hope that all of these events will be live streamed and viewable on both the SACEPA and Situating Science websites. We're attempting a test run of this technology tonight in the room, so hopefully that'll work out. But the programs nonetheless will be available in their entirety to view on the website in coming months. Before I go, there are evaluation sheets on the desks in front of you. We'd really appreciate it if you'd fill them out because your thoughts are very important to us about what you think about this presentation, which I'll now let you get to. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'd now like to introduce to you one of the visionaries I spoke about a few moments ago, and that is Penny Park. Um, Penny has been the executive director of the Science Media Center since uh, January of this year. Um, where she, uh, came, she came from, um, the, uh, actually she came from the Discovery Channel where she'd been working on the Daily Planet and previous to that she'd been uh, with Quirks and Quarks where she was a producer and senior producer from 1980 to 1995. Um, Penny tells me that her heart really is in God's country here in Atlantic Canada. Her mother is from PEI and I know that she spends every summer there if she can. Um, and she's a graduate, of, a graduate of UNB and so welcome to God's country, Penny. Thanks, Chris. I think it's God con God's country even when it does rain like this. I really do. So good evening to everybody and thank you so much for coming out. Um, on, on behalf of the Science Media Centre of Canada, I would like to welcome you. So increasingly, science pervades our lives, from green crabs and invasive sea squirts, to climate change, to erupting volcanoes and discoveries of new planets. Knowing about these stories and, and issues isn't just good cocktail conversation, because of course it is, but it's also knowing about them can influence our economy, help direct our priorities as a nation. And good reporting to bring scientific information to the public is essential. And yet media organizations in this day are crunched. Journalists are facing increasing, more rapid news cycles and fewer resources. Nick Davies, who's a columnist and a writer, he's written uh, Flat Earth News, actually uh, had a study done in the UK by the University of, uh, of Cardiff in Wales. 
And they found, they looked at uh, Fleet Street reporters, and they found that today, Fleet Street reporters in the big papers, not just the tabloids, are actually responsible for pumping out three times the amount of copy as they did 30 years ago. So there's an incredible squeeze on journalists today. And yet at the same time, as I say, the number of science stories are increasing and the complexity of those stories is just growing. So into this landscape comes the Science Media Centre of Canada. It's here primarily to help generalist journalists cover science when it hits the headlines. It's connecting journalists to evidence-based research and researchers to ensure that good quality, evidence-based science is at the table. And just as an aside, when I, when I say science, I mean, I know the engineers hate that, but I do mean engineering, I mean the social sciences, I mean um, health and environment, all broad aspects of science. So the vision of the Science Media Centre of Canada is to inform public debate with evidence-based accurate science by helping journalists cover science when it hits the headlines. Our mission is to improve the quality and quantity of reporting in all fields of science, and our goal is increased public engagement with science issues through media coverage that is accurate, incisive, and evidence-based. We incorporated as a non-profit in 2009. We received our charitable status in July, and we opened our doors September 27th, providing journalists across the country, as I say, with evidence-based science researchers and connections. So the core services that we are providing include rapid response. So what that means is when something hits the headlines and you're a reporter and you need to cover it, you can call us and we'll help you get in touch with an expert who is vetted, bona fide expert in that area, and can communicate effectively with a journalist. We send out expert comment quotes so that this is a hard copy of quotes from a variety of scientists on different aspects of a story with a little bit of a, a contextual um, backgrounder on the top. We provide those. We provide more detailed backgrounders on complex stories uh, or on, uh, they can be backgrounders on a tsunami, on a volcano, on um, a new hominid species, or even uh, medical isotopes. In the six weeks since we've opened our doors, we've already fielded calls from reporters across the country. We've sent out expert quotes on issues like the marine census and uh, Canadian commentary on an American study of direct-to-consumer genetic tests. We are fundamentally a journalistic organization. We aim to present no particular point of view, and, and we want to present the breadth of scientific knowledge and, and evidence. Helping us remain true to our journalistic roots, we have an editorial advisory committee uh, from um, one of whom is uh, one of our members is here, David Secco, from Concordia, uh, from journalism schools in uh, Ryerson, um, the chair of uh, the CTV chair of science broadcast journalism at Carleton, uh, the chief bureau, bureau chief from Radio Canada. Um, these people are, and Peter Calamai, who's the chair, who you might know as well, a very respected uh, journalist here in Canada, science journalist, and Quirks and Quarks, the, the um, executive producer of Quirks and Quarks as well. So they keep us kind of on the straight and narrow journalistically, and keeping us true to our evidence-based science are... Uh, a research advisory panel of experts, who are some of whom are here too tonight, and uh, they will uh, vet, help vet our experts, and also keep their eye on the horizon for things that are coming up that we can actually uh, present 
uh, you know, embargoed information, briefings, contextual briefings for the journalists so they know what's, um, what's coming up. So um, those are, that's kind of the background of, of uh, the Science Media Centre of Canada. Um, certainly, I'm looking forward to hearing from our, from our panel here who will be able to tell you what it's like from the front lines from their perspective. Um, and so to uh, keep them in line, of course, is Jay Ingram, who is... Uh, as you all know, I know. He actually said to me, I have a Twitter bio. It's Quirks and Quarks, Daily Planet, wrote books, won awards, and uh, I think there was maybe something else. And that just doesn't even, um, doesn't really describe it because, of course, he's written 10 books, three of, one, of which have won awards, has four honorary doctorates, just appointed as member of the Order of, the, of Canada, and, and I think is in fact one of Canada's national treasures. He is thoughtful, dedicated to communicating science, and striving always for excellence. And he's not a bad moderator once in a while, but he does need a producer, I always felt. Anyway, we're very lucky that, that Jay is a champion as well for the Science Media Centre of Canada. Jay. Producers will always say, hosts need producers. <clears throat> what wasn't said uh, in the preliminaries is that uh, for all of, most of the time that Penny was at Quirks, I was the host. For most of the time she was at Daily Planet, I was the host. And uh, I have utmost respect for her. I think that uh, there's no other person in this country that could do the job that she has been selected to do. Now, Penny mentioned a lot of words, though, that I would consider to be loaded words. Uh, engagement, encourage engagement with the audience, uh, provide better coverage. And I think that to any of us who have been involved in science journalism, either from the science end or the journalist end or the consumer end, uh, would probably recognize that perhaps the job isn't being done perfectly yet, may never be, that there are issues that we need to come to grips with to improve the coverage of science, and that's what the pan this is one of the things that this panel is going to address. Uh, I'll just introduce them quickly now, but then each is going to take a few minutes to tell us what their interests in science journalism are. Uh, we will be encouraging, strongly encouraging questions from the audience, but uh, I'd appreciate it if um, we hold those until each of the panelists has had a chance to speak their piece. And then we're hoping it's going to be a free-for-all. Because I know there are people in this audience with strong opinions. It's too bad you have to live where it's like Noah's flood, though. <laughs> so immediately to my left, Pauline Dakin. She is a national health and uh, medical reporter for CBC Radio. Next to her, David Secco. He teaches journalism at uh, Concordia University in Montreal. And uh, I will um, amplify these introductory remarks a little bit. And finally, on the far left, Dr. Mary Ann White, whom many of you uh, will already know. Now, Pauline Dakin, uh, because she covers medical issues, is really at the forefront of contentious journalism from time to time in ways that a physics specialist, a, uh, an earthworm specialist might not be. Uh, she's, been, she's won multiple awards. That's sort of my Twitter intro for you. Many awards, lots of reporting. She's a very, very good medical reporter, and she has served many different roles in the journalism world as well, from being on air to producing to being an assignment editor. She's worked in many media, film, television, radio, and print. You couldn't ask for more comprehensive experience. Pauline. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I'm, I'm really excited to see so many people here excited about science and excited about science journalism. So uh, th this is really nice for us and we're really looking forward to getting to all your pointy questions. So in that interest, I'm, uh, I'm editing on the fly here what I want to say to you, but I guess the, the thing is uh, you know, we want to talk about why reporting is important on science and for me medical issues. Um, and the thing that I keep in mind when I'm working on stories is uh, some fairly recent research that says that nine out of 10 Canadians say that they have changed their behavior as a result of something they heard in the media, some health or uh, medical reporting that they heard. Uh, for example, they might change what or how much they eat or drink. They might start or stop taking certain vitamins. Um, they might decide to get more physical activity. But I guess the bottom line is we have uh, the, the power to actually um, cause harm if we don't get it right. So it, it is a big responsibility and, and it matters how we report. Um, so, you know, given that, I'll give you my whine about all the challenges that poor medical reporters face. Um, but first I want to tell you a little story. And that is something that happened at the end of last week. Uh, two fairly big medical stories were breaking late in the afternoon one day. One uh, was to do with a new drug called the Bigatran, which is something that everybody's been waiting for. It's a, an oral, it's a pill you can take as a blood thinner, as opposed to having to take warfarin that, you know, needs to be, you need to have your blood tested. It's a big deal. And so with only a few hours, I was trying to figure out, you know, how could, should we get something up on this? How could we do that? At the same time, I got word about um, a study that showed the first evidence of ability to detect lung cancers at an early stage. And of course, lung cancer is the deadliest cancer because it's undetectable um, when, it's, when it's early and, and treatable. So two stories. Up the pipe they go to Toronto, what do you like? Well, I was disappointed. Toronto wasn't as excited about the lung cancer story as I was. So they were gonna just do a little copy. So then you turn your attention to the Debigatran story, which you know is an interesting story that has the, will have impact for a lot of people. So then you've gotta find your experts and say, you know, what do you think about this? Is this, this feels big, is this really big? And you know, I talked to the author of the original research, talked to other kind of experts that I know, uh, some of who may be here tonight. Um, and you know, the, the consensus was, this is huge. People have been waiting for this. So that was more or less the story I did. And I have to say, I think it was the first time in 10 years of doing this that I did a, ooh, there's a new drug on the market story. And I felt a little bit uncomfortable about that. And sure enough, the next day, I get uh, an email from somebody who says, well, you know, we actually have some concerns about this research. And I thought I knew there was going to be somebody out there. I just couldn't find them when I had three hours to mount a story. So I feel as though I didn't, I didn't really get all the angles covered on that. And that is the worst feeling. You know, I, I hyped a drug uh, that now somebody says that could potentially harm someone. There, there's a signal that maybe there's an increased uh, risk of myocardial infarction. That, that's a bad feeling as a health reporter. So, you know, we, we do struggle to get it right, and there are a number of uh, challenges that, that can impact our ability to do that. So, so here's where the whining begins. Uh, but basically, you know, it's deadlines, and in this case it was a tight deadline. Uh, do you have time to gather the research and, and talk to lots of people who are expertise? to learn the context of the story. Uh, you know, the other, the other time issue is, quite often my story is a minute and a half long. Well, what can I tell you about a really complex story in a minute and a half? That's, that's the challenge. Um, and I think that the, another challenge is that there's a changing understanding of what a health story should be. Um, you know, I think there's increasing interest in the quick hit water, co water cooler stories. Uh, maybe less interest in, in the true science stories, and, and that's a, a something, a trend that I you know, feel a bit of concern about. And then there's the whole tension between getting it right, making a story relevant, and not torquing it, which um, you know there can sometimes be some pressure to do. Can't, can't you say that any sexier? <laughs> it's cell biology, you know. Um, blood thinning, that's pretty Blood sexy. thinning, hoo-hoo, yeah. Um, <laughs> 
you know, then there, those are some of the internal pressures. There's external pressures too. You know, I, I find that there's a great noise uh, around us all the time. You know, all, all of the studies, the news releases, the phone calls, um, the contacts from public relations people. It, it, everybody, there's a constant clamor. You know, get my story out there. Uh, and you have to try and cut through all of that and find what are the stories that really need to be told. Um, and then it's a matter of finding the credible clinicians or researchers who can who can tell you uh, you know about what it is, and these are people who are really busy, and you know try try and tell them you'd like to bring a camera and oh by the way can you pretend to work in the lab I know you haven't really done that in 15 years but we need the pictures, <laughs> and you know then then there's um, a volcano erupts somewhere in the world and that story that they gave their time for has been knocked off and sorry about that. Um, so, but if you do manage to uh, to put it all together, um, you are relying on research to be right. I hope we'll talk more about this. Uh, you're you're relying on the fact that that randomized control trial was well designed and really what they've concluded is real. And and you know I'm not a scientist. I trust a lot of people to help me reach those conclusions. So. All that whining to say that it, it's a tough job to do even when you do it every day, but there are hundreds of general assignment reporters out there who are asked to do this at the drop of a hat. And so here's this great breaking medical news story, go get it. And you know, don't know where to begin, don't know the right questions to ask, uh, don't understand what the potential biases of research are, all of those things. And so I guess that's where the Science Media Center I, I see as a potentially very valuable organization for people who are, are dropped into what can be you know, complex uh, kinds of stories to tell. So I'm, I'm passing it along so we can hopefully get to some really great questions. Thanks. But before we do that, I said that you can't ask questions yet, oh. but that doesn't mean I can't. <laughs> Does it? So I, all I want, actually a comment, but if you want to respond. So, Pauline said some really fascinating things, I think. One is that someone in Toronto, inevitably, of course, uh, <laughs> it wasn't me, uh, made a decision that the blood thinner story was more to their taste. And, you know, one of the things I'd like to know is what is driving those decisions? The other quick thing I'd say is that if you did speak to the lead author, it's interesting that he didn't express any reservations about mm -hmm. the use of the drug. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of, of story selection, you know, if I knew that, <laughs> it yeah. would make my job a lot easier. Uh, and, it, you know, sometimes it's who's on the desk. Sometimes it's, you know, that there may be some relation to a previous story that was of interest. Or maybe they don't want it because there was a previous story somehow tangentially related to this that, oh, we've heard that before. So you, you, you can't really predict. And, and sometimes it's maybe my pitching. Maybe I didn't pitch it right. Maybe I didn't say the right things that made somebody say, oh, that'd be good. So I don't And know. it would depend who you were pitching it to. Absolutely. Yeah. So I see, I mean, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that makes it uh, very tricky. Okay, we'll move on. That was great, Pauline. Uh, David Secco is, uh, he's a guy I just met a couple of hours ago, but I already admire him because he studied uh, a species called Dictyostelium discoidium, which is a, a little, I'm serious. Well, he's a microbiologist, I'm a microbiologist. But this is a little uh, organism that moves around most of its life as individual amoebas, and then it uh, under chemical signals, they flow together and create a multicellular slug that searches around on the forest floor and then rises up and the top ones turn into spores and they disperse and start it all over again. It's an incredibly fascinating organism. Uh, why he left studying that to become a journalist, I have no idea. <laughs> I'll explain. But he did. And he, uh, at, like Pauline, has had a, a, a varied life. He's won an, uh, the Hal Strait Gold Medal in Journalism for UBC's School of Journalism. So he's a PhD scientist, he's a journalist, and now he teaches uh, a variety of topics at Concordia. David Seco. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And uh, just let me know if I'm uh, oh, not sounding right as we go. So I'll try to make this short and sweet and try to give you a little bit of a sense of, um, I guess, why I left science, why I went to journalism, what I'm thinking now, and what it's like to um, teach, I guess, about 15 to 16 students a year um, to be science journalists. And I'm using science the same way Penny was very loosely. 
um, on that kind of a level and hopefully pick up on some of these ideas. I wrote some notes. So I think to understand um, the first question is why is Dave here with all these very famous people? Um, I guess it has to do with my background a little bit. And um, what that has to do with was the fact that at one point in an undergrad class, a professor dimmed the lights, put a dictostelium movie up where you see the little waves of cyclic AMP moving out and the cells moving together to this... Um, um, to come together into this multicellular organism. And I think in the back, may or may not be true, I can't remember, fuzzy background, I may have slammed the desk and went, damn, I need to study that. I really do <laughs> need to go and figure out why it does that, how it does that. I was so excited, I almost burst out of my seat. Um, I started putting in grad applications as soon as I could find where to go on some level. And at that point, I guess I made a decision to move into learning more about science and to leave a little bit of my other passion, which was to write about science to talk about science and to tell people about science. So at the time I had, which I would look back on, I think a, an interesting um, kind of thought in my mind that to be a science journalist, to be a really good science journalist, I better have a graduate degree in science. I better do as much science as I could to do it. And I'm not so sure that the truth of that anymore. Uh, I'm not so sure that's actually accurate at all. Um, I think that's one maybe piece of the puzzle and one that's maybe over-dramatized at times and hopefully one we'll talk about. But I definitely felt at that age that I need to go out, I need to learn some more, I need to learn how it worked, how it, what happens in a lab, those long hours, um, the experiments, how I figure things out, how I decide that my hypothesis might be true or not. And I just felt like if I wanted to be a writer, if I wanted to go out and write books, if I wanted to write magazine articles, which is what I really wanted to do, um, I needed to do a little bit of that at that point. So I went to UBC and I started to study dictostelium and I spent six years, which snowballed from a master's into a PhD by accident. Actually, that's another story for later <laughs> tonight. Um, and um, at the end of that degree, after long experiments, what Jay didn't say is that dictostelium takes hours upon hours to do that. And we used to do time-lapse photography and sleep on cots in the lab beside the organisms to make sure they were still doing that and get up check them, make sure our liquids and buffers were good, go back to sleep in our little cots, like a war room in the middle of a UBC building with no windows. And I decided that my life wasn't as charmed as I had hoped it might be in this particular element. And it was time to leave. It was time to become a journalist. It was time to become a writer. And it was time to go out and, and communicate this science. And one of the reasons I felt I really need to do that is every year I spent in grad school, I talked to less and less people. I got more and more fatigued with explaining what I did, even explaining it to my parents. Oh my God, you want to hear again about what I do? <laughs> Let me try to tell you what I do. Okay, did you get that time? Oh, maybe, maybe not. Does it matter? And I started to ask myself that question more and more. I went from being an undergrad to talk to virtually everyone about science, how cool it is, the things you could do, how fantastic I love this, how this was going to change the world, or how, wow, we could really live in a better culture if we just figured out this problem. Is somebody working on that? I wonder, wonder, I really wonder if they are working on it somewhere out there. Two, talking to some grad students, 20 or 30 of us that started, some professors, maybe a few other colleagues, to the next year, talking to the people in my lab and talking to my professor only about this deeper and deeper problem, trying to figure out how the dictostelium cells actually came together, till in the last year, basically talking to six other committee members and trying to convince them to give me a PhD. And that's it, <laughs> right? The world had focused down into nothing um, on some level, and it was only through... I guess that process that I began to understand how much and how deep I had gone into something and how hard it was to be able to dig myself out, to be able to tell people about what I did and why it was interesting and where that passion within me for science actually came from. So as I kind of burst out of that um, on some level, um, slowly, um, I began to write, I began to be a journalist, I began to come back to UBC School of Journalism and learn a little bit about this. And at that point, I guess I wanted you guys to know that little bit of a story so that you can kind of interpret some of my comments. Because what I wanted to say is, I think this happens to most journalists I've talked to, I'm not going to say it happens to always, but after about five or six years of doing it, of writing stories, I stopped in my tracks and said, why am I, and I want to swear, but why am I doing what I do the way I do it? Why did Margaret Monroe, who taught me to be a science reporter, teach me to report science that way? Why was I doing what I was doing in that particular way? And I found that I didn't have a great answer. I knew particularly why I was doing something because I wanted to get across to people, I wanted them to understand things, I wanted them to be engaged, I wanted them, all these loaded words, I wanted them to be happy about science and be like, yay. I wanted them to understand the problems that might affect their lives and the things that I think should be going on and being debated about the outcomes of science. But I wasn't exactly sure what was behind that. 
And I only want to say a few points to lay it off because I know I don't want to take up too much time. I, I want to talk about five things that I kind of have on my mind at this point. Number one is I came to the conclusion that translation is not enough. Just translating science from jargon into general stuff that anybody could understand was not nearly enough. That we need, while more information is very important, it is only the beginning of what I think a real science journalist, and I think there's amazing, wonderful science journalists out there, is trying to do. Of what they're trying to do for society, of what they're trying to be, of what they're trying to represent. They're not just there as these translators trying to move one piece of language into another. There's more than that. The second thing I want to say is that there's a brand new environment out there that the students I'm teaching are living in that's very interesting and very different. A lot of the people I talk to and are very engaged in science, in science writing and science blogging, are no longer getting paid for it. There are a bunch of enthusiasts online who are writing about it nonstop and not necessarily part of a media organization. As special science journalists have kind of whittled down a little bit in Canada, these, this population has exploded in some ways. And that changes the game. It changes it hugely. And it changes it into a fact that science is becoming, in my mind, from when I was in grad school, more and more medialized. And what I mean by that is it's becoming more and more normal for people who do science to interact with the media, to have it a part of their lives, for it to be part of their promotion within a university, for it to be important for them to get grants and to get money. It's becoming this part of their lives that changes, again, the game that we might hopefully hear a little about, about what they have to do. And the last thing I'll say is that one of the things I'm very interested in is bringing together people in, inter in environments like this to talk about science, to talk about science journalism, to talk about the different things that go on, and to ask the question, what is good science journalism versus bad science journalism? What are we after? And what I often come back to is, you have to answer the question, journalism is meant to do X. And when you have that answer, and most people would say at the base is that it's supposed to produce good stories that matter, is the base I often hear. That is it. Journalism should produce good stories that matter. From there, fractures into a million, zillion, zillion debates about how you do that and how that gets done. And I think those are the conversations that we need to have and go through. When I talk to people, they get into this, I often hear things that people who read science, science journalism, don't know how to distinguish necessarily good from bad science journalism. And journalists aren't doing a good enough job to tell them how to. How do we know the good from the bad science journalism? That people aren't sure how we might co-evolve trusted forms of information things like the Science Media Center kind of filling up, that people aren't always discussing the differing expectations that journalists versus scientists for the public have for what their journalism should do. And finally, that it's not, in my mind, very clear how we actually build trust between these groups and how we do it. And I think if we could get to that question, which is a big one, one of ethics and all sorts of things, I think we'd be much further along in these discussions than sometimes we are. Great. I would just say one quick thing. It's not even a question. But <laughs> Uh, underlying both these presentations so far, or implied in them, is the importance of audience. And uh, I think it's fair to say that traditionally, like you take the point, it, it's not enough to just to translate. Well, you know, I, I mean, for a long time, I think scientists and even complicit in this were science journalists. It was just enough to throw the story out there. And so it lands on the floor and nobody reads it. Well, who cares? You know, and that's just so wrong. And I think a, a stronger uh, link to the audience, thinking about the audience, is going to be something that uh, I hope comes up in the discussion. So Marianne White, Dr. Marianne White, when I first met Marianne, I was knocked out because she was a professor of chemistry and a professor of physics. I didn't think that was actually possible. <laughs> I mean, you were one or you were the other. Well, now she's a university research professor. That's the university with a capital U. And actually, she's university research professor in chemistry and physics. Now, if you want an academic title, <laughs> that is the ultimate. But Marianne is somebody also whom I did meet a long time ago and have met many times since. Why? Because she's been dedicated to communicating science to diverse audiences. Marianne. Thank you very much, Jay. You make me blush. I didn't know I could still do that. <laughs>
Well, I, I'm really pleased to be here tonight because I really believe in the objectives of the Science Media Center. And it's just amazing to, to look at the journalism's uh, scientist, come journalist, and, and scientist as we go down the table here and think about the objectives of, of the Media Center and the objectives of the audience about learning more about how to integrate science in, in their lives as members of the various publics. The title of our, our discussion tonight is Science and Its Publics very carefully chosen because there are many different people who, and different aspects of people, we have a great demographic here tonight, um, who are interested in science and bringing science forward. Well, first I'll just tell you a little bit about some of my activities in bringing science to the public. It really has involved all of the media, I think. I've done things in, in newspaper articles. I've done things uh, on TV with Jay way back with at Discovery Canada when it first started. Um, and I've done things uh, definitely in radio, uh, uh, quirks many times, and, and uh, that's where I first met Jay, of course. And a lot of people in the region would know that Richard Wassersug, give a wave, Richard, and I <laughs> monthly do uh, answer the, sci the public's questions about science on a uh, phone-in on CBC Maritime Noon on an irregular basis, but approximately monthly. And we've learned, I think, over the years that, that the public really is interested in science. And we're not just talking about scientists who are interested in science, but people generally. And I think that shows in tonight's audience. And I'd really like to take the aspect of a scientist being involved in this as part of a career move, which it is for me and it is for many scientists. Not enough, but, but some. There are really two aspects of this. And one is educating the public or publics which I think is absolutely fascinating because I think that the appetite of the public for understanding how things work is insatiable. People who aren't necessarily trained as scientists want to know more about science. People who are trained in a particular aspect of science want to know more about science. And if you become the sort of scientist that I have become, which is the sort as my career uh, matures, uh, become more and more interested in things wider and wider in my peripheral vision rather than Dave's story, which is a very typical PhD student story and also true for the PhD students in my lab where you learn more and more about less and less as the years go by till they put those letters behind your name. Then uh, anyhow, if you go to the, the former, being interested in more and more things, it's nice to make those connections and that's an advantage of age is that you see those connections in sharing those connections of how the world works, I, I think is absolutely amazing. Then there's the other aspect of being a scientist and working with the media. And that's talking to journalists about your own work or bringing things forward. And this can come in two ways. Uh, you might approach them or they might approach you. I think that it all boils down to that. Let's start with the uh, they approach you question. Now, there are some scientists in this audience who I know have, have uh, had media experiences about talking about their own research work. I have too. And, uh, if, if they approach you to ask something about this, it's something that you really have to ask yourself the question first. Is there anything here to talk about? I could give you some examples where there hasn't been anything to talk about, but people have talked to the media, and it doesn't really reflect very well on anybody. So it, there's no harm in saying no, and there's also the possibility of passing it off to somebody who might be a better person to talk about this. And this is, again, put in plug for the Science Media Center, a great role for them, that they have these experts who will get you some background information if you're a journalist in a short period of time, and uh, these are people who really can answer your questions. Then there's the idea of going forward to the media yourself with an idea that is something you've been working on and when you should do that. And I think that when you should do that, this is my personal opinion, but I think other scientists might share this opinion, is when something is coming forward and has been peer-reviewed. I really hate to read in the media, I'll put it right out there, about somebody who just got a grant and hasn't done anything yet, and they're already saying what it's going to do to save the world. That hype doesn't do anything to help scientists, and I don't know why scientists talk to the papers or whoever at, at that point. But there, there still is, are a few other points, I'm sure many are going to come up, but I, I just want to say that I don't want to talk for 50 minutes, like we're all taught to talk for 50 minutes as, as uh, professors. That's, you know, it's zero or 50. There's not much in between. <laughs> and that's a problem, too, when it comes to getting a sound bite. A sound bite that can last for 15 seconds on the radio uh, is not really uh, well produced out of a 50-minute uh, piece of information. So scientists have to learn how to boil it down. I think I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> So what's the difference between boiling it down and dumbing it down? Uh, 
Well, first off, jargon. Get rid of the jargon. And so, so that you can actually talk in everyday language. And I think the more scientists talk to everyday people about their work, the more proficient they're going to become at being able to say something that is intelligible in a short period of time. And I don't think you have to dumb it down. Any comments among the three of you before we go to the audience? For that question or in particular? Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, I think that the scientists who are best at boiling it down or, or you know, being concise but still pithy um, are uh, people who can give you good examples in everyday life, you know, who have thought about their work in such a way that they, they can give you a great example that makes the audience go, oh, okay, I get that. Yeah. A hook. A ho well, a hook. Yeah. A simile. It used to be true that scientists who were active in the media were uh, treated with disdain by many of their colleagues. Is that still true? <laughs> okay, sometimes yes, sometimes no. I, I can give you an example from uh, an area of research that's not my area of research, but I have several colleagues working in this area, and that's lithium ion battery research. And there's tons of information on this in the media all the time. And my two colleagues who work in this very closely, I've discussed this with them a lot, one of them a lot today, and asked why there's so much hype that doesn't stand up in this, in this area. And those people are treated with disdain. And it's because the pot of gold at the end of that rainbow is so huge. They want to get their name out there and they, they want to get uh, something going with venture capitalists and have an IPO and make some money. That's a very negative view of that, but that, I'm just sharing that view. But that wouldn't be necessarily the motivation for all scientists who are media friendly, right? I don't think so. <laughs> I certainly hope not. You'd be so out of a job, I'm just Jay. curious because, you know, um, Carl Sagan, a perfect example, uh, David Suzuki, uh, both were uh, maligned, much maligned. I think Sagan was uh, denied membership in the National Academy of Sciences in the States simply because he did a TV series. And I'm just curious to know because I don't, I'm not uh, involved in, in those kinds of discussions. I'm outside of that realm. Does that still happen? I don't really think so. I think these days it's more appreciated if the scientists are talking to the media at appropriate times. Okay. Questions? Uh, if you'd like to go to a microphone, please, and you can either direct your question to an individual on the panel or to the entire panel or to anybody you want, really. I commend you for this incredible effort I just finished reading a wonderful book called Galileo's Daughter, and it's gorgeous. I recommend reading it. It's a biography of Galileo based on a correspondence with his daughter in a nunnery. I learned a lot about Galileo that I didn't know before. One of them was he understood that ownership of knowledge and having the power to create it through research and also the power to hold knowledge back from ordinary people was essentially the power that was most oppressive in his life, which was the Roman church. He dared, above the censure of all of his compatriots, he dared to lecture and write in Italian. He started growing the first secular public for scientific knowledge and what eventually became Protestantism and the Reformation and modern society. I have more respect for his courage as a person because it meant burning at the stake, you know, if you get nailed wrong by the Inquisition. Uh, I remind you, the current Pope's previous job with the church was running the Department of the Inquisition. Nothing much has changed. Uh, a year ago, I was in this room, and I'm part of the Joe Howe Initiative. We were celebrating Joe Howe. Joe Howe won freedom of the press for the world in this town. And he knew that it was critical for social democracy to work that everyone have as much knowledge as possible about as many things as possible in as timely a manner as possible. He hated guildism and the use of knowledge for economic and political advantage. I'm presuming that the state of the media in North America right now and in the world and the state of universities and the state of academic freedom is a lot to do with why you've decided to create this center. And I'd like you to elaborate, if you would, on some of the background reasoning and thinking that you've had to make this very bold uh, move, and I commend it again. Well, really, that's a question for Penny, but uh, I could channel you if I... <laughs> uh, 
I th uh, there's a science media center in England that has played a critical role. Uh, it was in response, really, to the rejection of genetically modified uh, foods, uh, the very, very strong rejection based on not very strong arguments, that it was felt important that a science media center be created there. And it's played a really important role in, I think it's fair to say, generally raising the level of scientific awareness in England. There's a similar organization now in Australia. They're starting to do the same thing. Uh, you know, it's been partly precipitated by the fact that specialist, specialists, you know, like... Um, Peter Calamai, for instance, who's science reporter for the Toronto Star for decades, uh, no longer doing that. He retired, but still he hasn't ever been replaced. And so if you look in both Canada and the United States, the number of specialist science reporters, people that actually have significant background knowledge, uh, is diminishing dramatically. And I think it... I think it's easily arguable that then the quality of information that's disseminated is not as good. It's more general. It's bland. Uh, the essence of the story may not be picked up. And, you know, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's the situation that uh, you mentioned where, you know, maybe decisions are being made, again, by people that, <clears throat> well, almost certainly by people who have no specialized knowledge. And, you know, maybe it should have been the lung cancer story and not the blood thinner story. Uh, so uh, an organization where non-specialists can go and get rapidly because uh, you know as Pauline has pointed out you, you don't you have three hours can go and get solid information potential interviewees pull them all together and then the first chunk of your work has been aided materially then you write a you know then I, it's a presumption I think but you end up writing a better story doing a, a more informed you know research is key to good science journalism because if you can make every sentence a well-informed sentence then you've done a good piece. And I think that's the rationalization for starting it. And I'll, can I just add um, uh, an interesting, just from my own perspective, a little tidbit in the sense of from um, Concordia's journalism school, from a student perspective at least there, um, I find that something is in the air about science, about health, about environment, in ways that it wasn't for me before, um, even in my short career in the sense of the students that come to my class, to my science reporting class, aren't wanting to be specialists anymore. Some of them maybe were a few out of the 16, maybe one or two. The rest of them are there and will say flat out to me, I hate science. I've always hated it, but I need to learn how to report it better because I know that it's becoming a more and more, a bigger and bigger issue that I'm going to have to deal with in my career. And I found that just blew me away in the sense of I was expecting 20 students that loved science and wanted to do it, and instead I got, you know, 80% of students who didn't dislike science as much as I'm saying, but enough that they weren't planning to be specialists or trying to be specialist reporters. Well, and in fact, the Science Media Center will serve people who don't want to be or are not. At Daily Planet, we have 16 producers producing science stories, there may not all be science stories, but they're pretty close. Uh, one of them has a science background. But they're good journalists, and they're good television journalists, and they know what makes a good story. And, but even, the, even those people, if they have a science media center to go to, say, I want to get some background on this story that we're chasing in Arizona, bang, you've got it. Uh, my name is Michael Marshall, and I'd like to put a little rain on on the on uh, to fall <laughs> on the Science Media Center and its interest in in better mm -hmm. science journalism. Because I like to argue that um, sometimes we need bad science journalism, and I'm going to quote show a couple of examples from history that we all probably know about. Uh, one of them that won a Pulitzer Prize, by the way, um, penicillin. It was discovered in '28, um, publicly published in '29, but it wasn't until '43. Uh, when it was discovered popularly by the entire world, almost overnight, during a war when, when communication was cut off from all the countries. And almost immediately, all the countries' governments decided they had to produce the stuff. Um, the story came out of uh, the, the Hearst publication, in fact, their flagship, the people who invented yellow journalism, if you... Um, the guys who started the Spanish Civil War, they had a terrible reputation. Um, but they did a story on a dying girl, and her parents decided that they were going to buck their government, who wasn't giving penicillin, or wasn't producing penicillin, and they turned it into a, 
what I suppose you could call either a sob sister story or what we used to say a story that ends up on the women's page. But when it got to Dr. Mum, it got to everybody else. And that was bad journalism. If you go back and read that story, it's as purple as you can get. But it had a dramatic effect. And we did get penicillin 15 years late, but with the last time of the war. Now, another more contemporary one is, I believe it was Reader's Digest or, or perhaps the, one of those tabloids that you get in, in the grocery stores. They did a story on uh, a guy who said that ulcers were caused by bacteria. It had been floating around for a long time, but from what I understand, that story did not feed back into both science and science journalism until it had become a big popular story among working class people who read Reader's Digest and uh, those, those um, you know, spaceships ate my mom um, things. Now, this, these are rebuts. Rebut these, these are serious rebuttals to serious science journalism. The, in both cases, I think people were too close, the science journalists were too close to scientists and took the line they took. In Pendleton's case, they said, hold off on it till we synthesize it. Well, they never did. And that was the day when chemistry sort of decli started declining, biology started coming up, when we ended up with, you know, natural penicillin was the cure all. So I think we have to be aware that sometimes bad science journalism does the job. I'd like to hear your comments well, on that. Well, I'd like to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those are two interesting examples. I don't actually buy the ulcer story because, uh, in fact, the, uh, the, the researcher in Australia who hit on this story did indeed have a very tough time convincing his medical colleagues that he was right, and he was going against the grain, but you can't argue that it was Reader's Digest that, that changed their opinions and changed medical opinion uh, and you know, then persuaded doctors to start dispensing antibiotics for, for ulcers. Um, you know, but if bad science journalism is good for us, well, we should be in pretty damn good shape because there's been a lot of it. <laughs> um, so, you know, you've given us two examples uh, covering um, some 50 years. Uh, you know, I would only point to the link between childhood vaccines and autism as an example of just how bad and how serious bad journalism can be. It's not even science journalism. It's, it's popular talk shows inviting guests that know nothing and don't hesitate to spread personal anecdotes disguised as science. That's bad journalism, and that's much more serious. Comment. Well, I, I would just say, out of all of those two stories, I mean, there are many, many good stories, so I'd rather focus on the plus. I, I will add um, an interesting thing, and, and we keep hearing P Peter Calamai's name, and I, I don't want to overdo it in that way, but he uh, once um, told me um, a very interesting idea that goes along with this, and I would agree, I'd push back a little on it a bit, but also this idea of the question of why, let's say, during climate change debates or things like that, are minority voices or minority scientists that other people might not respect or scientists that are working for oil companies, however you want to put it, how come they get their voice in the media? How come they get there? How come that keeps happening? How come science journals don't stop that from happening? And he always had this interesting kind of thing that he told me is, well, sometimes those minority voices turn out to be right. We can't cut them all out. They can't all not exist. There has to be a way for them to get in at times. And this is back to this, how do you do it? When do you know when it's good versus bad? And when can bad, I don't think bad's the right word, but when can the outside the box story push forward and help us kind of get to a better place. That's actually a really important issue because it's, it's quite crucial. Um, in Alberta, uh, there's a great sensitivity to the oil sands issue these days. And um, the uh, oil companies will now admit, do admit actively and publicly that they haven't done a good job of communicating the science. So at our Banff uh, Science Communications Program, we uh, invited... We've done it for two years now, invited Imperial Oil scientists to come and talk about the science of the oil sands. But the fact is, there, there is lots of science being done. There's lots of research at the University of Alberta and the University of Calgary. Uh, lots of engineers working to make this process much more sustainable. But that's not really the issue. It's not what the research is. It's what are they doing on the ground right now, and what are the economic decisions that are being made, for instance, to open a new oil sands plant in 2012 that ultimately will be in situ underground so there'll be no tailings ponds 
Unfortunately, that's only going to be the situation in 2014. So for two years, this new plant, the Curl plant, is going to be generating tailings ponds. Well, you know, then the question is an economic one. Why can't you wait two years and score big points, environmental points? Well, I think you all know the answer. That's two years of not making money. Yes. Hi. Um, <laughs> I am uh, in my first year of sciences making the switch over from humanities. Um, thanks very much to shows like Quirks and Quarks. So thank you, Jay. And uh, I was, um, the more I, I learn about um, topics like biology and like getting into genetics and molecular biology, the more I see such a disparity between what I hear and what I'm learning. And a lot of the disparity I feel comes from um, an inability to maybe express ambiguity on popular broadcast media. And uh, I'm just wondering if there is a place for that at all. <laughs> okay. Probably not in the news world, but perhaps in the current affairs world. Uh, you know, news is looking for definitive statements, and uh, there is not a, a whole lot of discussion. But I think, I think that ideally there, there is a, a, a format, a place where you can have conversations about things where you can get at some of those ambiguities and disparities. I would agree. I think that a lot of the social media now could, attack, could tackle that. So things aren't being presented as a little package all wrapped up with a ribbon, but looking at the both sides because many of these things aren't black and white. I mean, I guess one of the difficulties as well is who's going to interpret that ambiguity and what's going to fill that space, right? I think a lot of people um, that I talk to as journalists are worried that when you leave those questions open, somebody's going to jump in uh, um, and push things off. And I, I would like to hear your, maybe a response to that in some senses. And I guess the other element is I agree that online now, I think there's, there's beginning to be a push um, to move away from this idea that stories have to be self-contained and not connect to the other elements of science in the sense of coffee good, coffee bad is the example I always hear, but instead begin to link those stories together um, um, in a way that people can follow science instead of just get the quick hits. Yeah, and that is the beauty of having websites associated with broadcasters and newspapers is that you can sort of take it that step further. There's also this danger, you know, in this, the, the, you know, the social media and, and the blogging and so on, how do you know what filter is on any of this? How do you know what are what are the credentials? What's the credibility of the writer? And you know, there's you can say anything. You can say anything, and uh, I think that's that's a risk. Yeah. If you think about all these things, you end up in despair. <laughs> it is true. One of the first things I guess I learned was that sooner or later you got to put your foot down and say something and um, have a definitive point on it, and then to see, not necessarily just drop it on the floor and see if anybody reads it, but at least um, try to get a little bit of that ambiguity in there, but also decide and try to figure out as a science journalist, what is, what do we actually know, and what are we unsure about? And it's that harder and harder getting towards that unsure about because less and less space and more things to do. And I think we could kind of try to fill that space a little bit more. Yeah. And I guess the other thing is that you hear a lot, of, you know, last, last year vitamin E was good. This year it's bad. You know, there, it, it drives people crazy. It drives us all crazy. So stop taking it this year and take it next Just year. Just don't take it. I mean, really. <laughs> Eat your food. LAUGHTER <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess the thing is, ideally, uh, good journalism provides a context that, that is transparent about all of that. Well, you know, this study says this, but, you know, think of that in the bigger picture where, you know, that study said something different and, you know, there was, this group is still researching. You don't always have time for that. That's a problem. But, but when it's possible, that's, that's what you want to do. And I think that's what makes an audience trust reporting, is that you're looking at it from more than just this happened today and I'm telling you about it. Okay, as a scientist, I just have to add one more thing here. This story <laughs> that was about the blood from, from skin in the news the last couple of days, the print article I read with my breakfast this morning was very balanced and the headline was hype. <laughs> if you only read the headline, you would have really missed something. Usually the reporters don't write the headlines. I know, they should. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, I'd like to try and maybe add a little bit of ethics to the discussion here, since that's one of the sponsors. And I think earlier it was even mentioned, you know, science shows you how things work, or quite often I'll look at, at science will sort of tell you if X happens, then Y follows. So if you take climate change as an example, you know, we know through science if you throw so much GHGs in the air, in the atmosphere, a whole bunch of different things will happen. If we slow that down, we'll change the rate. If we want to go as far as, you know, economics being a science, they'll give us a cost. And, and quite often that all purports to say, well, okay, now we've got all this information, somebody has to do something. But there's also a piece on, you know, what ought we do? Having that information and there's sort of moral or ethical imperatives and, and a history going back from Aristotle to John Rawls that might help somebody decide, okay, given the information that science tells me, what should we be doing? And it's something I don't see in the media very often. It shows up a little bit, probably a little more in, in health, because there's some areas there, you know, reproductive technology, they get into that, but very rarely. And I'm just wondering, you know, what is the obligation, I guess, of the, the media in trying to take that one step and build a, a philosophical literacy as well as a scientific literacy? And what are the barriers to doing that? Well, one of the barriers is the time available. And so you will find such discussions, I think, in longer form programs, uh, maybe ideas on CBC Radio, where you could explore that. But it also depends on the issue. Uh, you know, if uh, there, there is a serious group of scientists and ethicists and engineers <clears throat> who continually debate geoengineering as a, as a possible strategy to curb global warming, and um, that's rife with uh, ethical issues you know, international agreements and so on and so forth, risking a, a technology that's tampering with the earth. Uh, and so I think that uh, that's a, maybe that's a more, more easily apprehendable kind of ethical decision. Oh, we're going to do this to the climate. Is that a good thing? So I think it, it's to some extent dependent on the issue. But, you know, if you're doing uh, three-minute TV pieces or on our show five-minute stories, it's pretty rare that uh, you're going to do. Uh, you're going to have the time. By the time you get the gist of the story out, when it takes you half the time to set the context of the story to begin with, you just don't have the time. But you know, it could be that we're biased into uh, biased by our interest in the guts of the science rather than the ethical uh, outcomes. We did it. We staged a. Uh, uh, seminar in Banff on neuroethics uh, a year and a half ago where the goal was, because the neuroscientists and the ethicists had discussed all of the ethical issues coming out of neuroscience, like lie detection by fMRI and stuff like that, but they hadn't communicated any of this to the public, and that was our point of doing this. Do podcasts, do short video interviews, do a public salon in Banff to get these issues out. So even, you know, I think the scientists and the ethicists recognize it, it's getting the media to recognize it too. And I, I'll just add like, um, I guess it blew me away the day that I realized and kind of understood that um, what Latour would often say is like science being socially constructed, that it was this thing that um, it is not just about the methodology, the scientific principles, producing the facts and things like that, but that as a journalist, I was so focused on that part of it so focused on the guts, so focused on the results that I forgot that science was everybody sitting here, the people that do it, the, the, the bodies involved, the questions and the decisions being made. So I think at that point in my career as a journalist, I started to get a lot more interested in the people, how the actual science is being created, how they actually go through the experiments, why they're choosing to do this, and what prior questions did they ask before they chose to do it. And you'll often find that many scientists have asked lots of questions about going one way or the other, and are very worried about the world that they might be creating for their children and for other people, but they haven't yet put that into the discussions they're having with journalists, put that into the discussions that they're having about their science when the press release comes out and they have that discussion. It's still back to the results, it's still back to the scientific facts, and we haven't yet done it enough to crack some of that down. And I don't know... Um, how to change that yet, but that's my response to the question. And I think uh, quickly that that's part of the fact that science journalism in the past has focused too much on the idea or the experiment and not enough on the people. Well, that's because scientists are so monotone. We're all the same in terms of personality, Jay. <laughs> I know, but we're thinking of maybe dressing you up and stuff like that. <laughs> that's a hard one, too. 
Hi there. Uh, I'm Mike Dewar. I'm a student at Dalhousie at the Schulich School of Law. As a student journalist, I feel like I should expose my own bias. I'm also the Green Party candidate federally here in Halifax. Um, that said, my, my, you know, my biased lefty question is about ClimateGate, the ClimateGate story that was picked up by the media earlier this year. Um, speaking of dressing up scientists and avoiding bias and trying to seek balance in reporting, um, the media loved this story about these sassy emails that were floating back and forth between some scientists studying climate change in the UK. Um, it was said that there was some misconduct potentially in their research, and of course it served to undermine you know, years of goodwill being built up by the scientific community in their study of climate change. Of course, later on the story was picked back up again, and uh, it was revealed that in fact everything was fine, and there was no real misconduct going on there, and that everything was rolling as it should be. But that story, the second story, was not as sensational and appealing as the first story. It wasn't as sexy as the first story, so to speak. And I'm wondering how the media can be more responsible in its treatment of stories like that in the future to ensure that while the facts come out, while the story comes out, that it's not misconstrued by the public to make sure that, you know, that we don't see that kind of tragedy occur again in public goodwill. Okay. Thanks. May I say, uh, well, actually, there's a third story. Uh, which is that, uh, and I, unfortunately I'm not going to be able to name names, but even some climate scientists who do believe in anthropogenic climate change feel that the investigations were inadequate. And so this is not, this story has not come to an end. And uh, the third story has gotten even less publicity than the second story. Uh, uh, and the... Uh, if, if I can catch up to you later, I'll try and find some uh, references. Uh, but it looks like uh, the, what the climate change deniers were saying, that this was all kind, that these were sort of set up and it looked like they were just going to confirm things. I mean, I do believe there wasn't much misconduct, but the criticisms now are about the quality of the investigations. So, you know, but it's not surprising that the first story got more ink. I mean, this looked salacious, and I mean, there was no sex, at least as far as anyone could tell. They're, they're climate scientists. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, it had that sense of scandal. Well, and people are going to respond to scandal, let's face it. You know, it is the media, right? Uh, and, and the media represent all of us. And a whiff of scandal is always going to take precedence over, you know, a better blood thinner. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to say. Of course, in the end, the irony is that those people who are so up on the scandal have died because they should have had the better blood thinner. <laughs> um, and, it, and I think it's on many of these questions an open question of what effect that kind of media coverage actually has on people. If whether people really remember really like that, it changed their attitudes toward climate change, and whether or not that blip that always happens and then it kind of lails down. Um, actually ends up doing much to the general public. I'm not saying it didn't, but I'm saying I don't know. I don't have a, an answer to tell you that. It shifted everyone's opinion on climate change or a big bulk, and that ended up in X. I think um, what's, what you might be more worrisome is what effect that, those kind of blips have on decision makers, like the people who read the media and make choices and make changes. What did that do to them? How did that affect them? Instead of wondering necessarily what did it do to the general public who may have never even read it and what, there was a climate gate scandal? Oh, wow, well, I didn't even know. Or they did and they forgot about it and then they heard the next one or they jump in at different places, right? Mm -hmm. So I find it an interesting question to ask myself often when I was a reporter of how, what, does, what do people need to know now and what can they get later? So I mean at some point when I'm trying to decide whether or not to get vaccinated or not, I might need information now, I need the facts, I have to know whether or not this vaccine is gonna hurt me, it's gonna hurt my baby because I'm pregnant or not. In other situations where it's not that right on that moment, it might be that it's fine that it's on the internet, that somebody's following it, and if I ever need that information, I'll go find it, I'll learn about it, and it'll be in a way that I can learn about it. So this immediate versus non-immediate kind of thing is an interesting problem I often had in terms of thinking about the stories I would write and how it's done. I know that doesn't answer your question at all, but it adds just some extra things to think about. <laughs> and I don't think I'm answering any questions tonight. <laughs> no, I've, been, I've been providing a perfect example. Uh, so, you know, we, we have, I think, 20 minutes uh, and really would like to get everybody to get their question out, so I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Uh, it's quite funny, really, because I was going to ask practically exactly the same question as he just did. Um, I was also just going to point out how influential it was that it happened a week before Copenhagen and what an impact that had. And um, 
big screw up basically. Mm -hmm. um, so to my secondary question, it was just going to be um, if becoming a uh, scientific journalist, do you think that you should become a scientist first and then go into journalism or become a journalist and then go to science? Thanks. There's an example of each of us on the panel. <laughs> I don't think it matters. But I'm going to say one thing I think you have to learn. You have to learn, if, if you've come at it from the journalism side, learn about numbers. Because numbers, <laughs> orders of... <laughs> million, billion, trillion, who chose those words? Come on, they sound too much alike. <laughs> They're very different. <laughs> okay, maybe this is a, Can I just talk about my pet peeve? Uh, is scientists who cannot tell me the difference between... Uh, relative numbers and absolute numbers out of their own research and numbers needed to treat or numbers needed to harm. I'm amazed. I'll say, you know, I, I need them to give this to me in a clip and they go, oh, oh. <laughs> And so I think that we should start a, a Facebook campaign for numbers <laughs> needed to treat. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just add quickly, um, diversity is good, in my opinion. Nobody would argue with that. Yeah. Uh, mention of a Facebook campaign might actually be a good lead into this question. Um, the so-called new media and the idea of uh, internet media, the blogosphere, has already come up a little bit. I'd like to hear a little bit more about it. Um, it seems to me that the, the inherently amateur nature of this new form of journalism that is emerging is a bit of a double-edged sword. Because on the one hand, the fact that there's not a career writing on it, the fact that there aren't necessarily promotions um, or money on the line means that um, a blogger can perhaps take more time on a story than a mainstream journalist might need to, or that they don't need to appeal to the same, necessarily to the same um, kind of sexy stories that uh, editors will choose. But on the other hand, um, it has already been mentioned that the you can wind up with people who know not, have no idea what they're talking about writing um, blog posts that seem, that seem authoritative. And furthermore, if a 15-second soundbite is no good, then a 140-character Twitter post is probably even worse. <laughs> um, so I just want to know what the panelists thought about that and the potential for the new online media to perhaps um, fill in some of the holes or cause more problems, as the case may be. I have a bias because, you know, I want people to come to CBC for their information. But um, I, I think, I, re I remember in university being quite amazed that I could pass in a paper and it seemed more important that I write it well than I actually know what I talk was talking about in some cases. And I think that that can be true with a blog as well. If it's well written, it seems it has a sheen of respectability about it that may not be real. Um, and so, you know, I, I, as I said earlier, I think there's risks. The other thing is nobody's vetting it. Who's vetting it? Who's the second set of eyes that most w journalists would have on their work? So, you know, that's my bias, but, but I do think those are things that people don't necessarily have and keep in mind when they're reading blogs. I have to declare an interest in this because I know I've taught a few people who are in this room and Wikipedia is not an acceptable reference for anything <laughs> in any, any of my courses. But I think having some discussion on these things can be, can be useful, but the, the lack of adjudication over them, it's certainly not peer reviewed. <laughs> um, I fall on different spots on different days, I'll say that. Um, but I will say that for me, what I see is a, is a struggle online for um, narrative authority. Who is it that has the authority to say that something is true or not true, that this science should be reported in that way or that way. <clears throat> Journalists have worked long and hard over centuries, decades, however you want to look at it, to have their authority be recognized, to have their voices be trusted, to have those things come out there. And I think bloggers are working on this. I think Twitter feeds and all that are working on trying to grab some of this authority and trying to make their work as authority as authoritative as possible. Whether or not it is or not, it raises questions, you're right, of expertise. Who should be defined as an expert that's able to comment on science? It raises questions of proportion. Do things just go viral online that are meaningless in the sense of we shouldn't be talking about that. There's 20 other things we should talk about. And the last one being how reliable is it? 
And I think on some level, we just need to think about ways that we're going to help people to decide what is reliable versus not online. And I think it's exactly the, these types of questions. Where do you look to what is trusted and what's not? And again, I know I'm not answering questions. A colleague of mine knows science journalists who turn to look at their Twitter feed first thing in the morning, not to get content, but to find out what people are talking about, the kind of people that they follow. So, you know, there's more uses to it than simply getting information. It's directing yourself to where the people you respect are looking. I'm a master's student in the Department of Oceanography here at Dalhousie, and I feel the same thing that, David, you were talking about uh, at the beginning when you said the sense of pressure to have the credibility with the PhD at your end of the end of your name. And I know I look for that even when I'm reading books for lay people in sciences. I look for that. And I'm wondering if you could, maybe all or any of you, let me know how important you think that credibility is. And then also to have maybe even a master's or a PhD in science, what the next step is to get into science communication. Like Marianne is a is still a professor here at Dalhousie, so I assume that's your mainstay. Oh, yeah, that's my main source of income. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then David, now you're a, a teacher of uh, journalism, science journalism, correct? So I'm wondering, do I then need to get a degree in journalism if I'm interested in doing science communication? Oh, there's so many ways to communicate science. You could work at a place like the Discovery Center or, or in something similar where you're communicating with the public. You could work in print. You could have a day job that is a research job and, and write on your own time. I think you have to find your own path on this and, and follow your bliss. Um, for me, it's um, on some level, yes, I think a journalism degree is becoming more and more important to being able to um, get a job in journalism. Um, on, on another level, I think it, what it does is it introduces you to the socialization of journalists and what they do and what they believe in. Um, but for me, I agree. You can do this no matter where you are, and it has to relate to your skill set, how comfortable you are, how you feel, and how you're going to move forward. If you feel like you're a great radio reporter now, if you feel like you're a great writer now, then go for it. But I say explore as early as possible and just kind of talk to people and kind of getting those out there. For me, it's about telling scientific tales. And if you want to do this, that's what you should be doing in your conversations, in your writing, in everything. And if you really believe that, don't let yourself be dissuaded by professors or parents or friends who tell you, no, that, there's no future in that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pat Ryle. I'm a geophysicist here at Dalhousie. And over the weekend, I was looking through a copy of Earth magazine and found to my horror that uh, seven researchers who did not predict the L'Aquila earthquake in April 2009 were placed under investigation for gross negligent manslaughter. And the prosecutor is claiming that because there were the tremors, they should have been able to predict that there was a big earthquake coming. <laughs> Now, as many of you may know, you often get a whole series of tremors and then a big earthquake doesn't come. And in their communications, they were quite clear about it that, yes, a big earthquake could come, but it's not really very likely. But of course, that got, tr in the translation, that essentially came out as, there's nothing to worry about. And I think this is, this is an issue I think we face with a lot of potential natural disasters, is that we know that something's quite likely to happen, but we can't predict when it's going to happen. And so if every time there might be an earthquake, you sort of say, well, there really could be one, you better take care, and it doesn't happen two or three times, then it's looked on as you're just crying wolf. And when you do really make a serious prediction, nobody's going to pay any attention to it. So I wondered if, if you folks had any idea about how, how we can, can bridge that gap so we can communicate to the public that there are potential dangers, but we just don't have that certainty into saying it's going to happen tomorrow or next year or next, or next century, but they still should be you know, away, aware of it and be sensitive to the potential dangers without just getting too blasé about the whole thing. Comes back to the point about numeracy and understanding probabilities <laughs> and trying to educate the public on this, so to, unless the probability is really zero. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> It's like the pandemic, you know? How do you warn people to prepare for a pandemic when nobody knows when it will actually arrive? Yeah. 
But, but of course, the American government's answer to that was, you know, the green, uh, yellow, and red light on terrorism, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess risk communication, I don't know quite enough about um, on some level to talk about, but I, I agree, this is a big issue of how you talk about the uncertainty and how these things get done and how you communicate these things and how, how people kind of take them to go forward um, with their decisions one way or another. I'm, I'm amazed to hear this and I'd love to talk about it more, but I don't think I have a good answer for this question in the sense other than um, I would really love to see a day or a, a time when we could figure out ways to connect these discussions to how journalism actually looks and is created. So how would you embed that type of um, controversy, that type of uncertainty in a story and then still make it do what it's supposed to do? I don't have an answer to that, but that is something that I would love someday to connect together. Yeah, conveying risk has always been a huge and unmet challenge. It's a, it's a, it, I don't, Which you already appear to know. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's a black hole to be filled there, is what well, I'm trying I, to say. I even know a man who pr predicted a risk and got sued for doing it. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, people, we have uh, seven minutes, and we've got four questions. So, panel? Mm -hmm. Jay? <laughs> okay. Um, it was mentioned a couple times that... Um, leaving the communication of science to simple translations is a very bad thing. But my question is, how do you, what do you do to make it a good thing? How do you go beyond translating? I'd say one quick thing, which is that if you just translate, say, a scientific paper, you're ignoring the context for that. And the scientist brings a much different context to a scientific advance than the, a layperson does. And to tell the story properly so that it makes some sort of impact, you have to spend some time in your story setting it up so that then the result, which you do have to translate into non-jargon terms, makes any sense at all. Simply just taking holus bolus, this body of information and putting it into lay language, that isn't a story, and you've got to tell stories. Yeah, it's context. It's what do we know about this previously? What does this add to the, to the knowledge about it? And for me, it's um, the media as one player in building communities of discussion around science, of these prior questions, of these ethical questions and these kind of ideas, and how the media can, on some level, and publics, and scientists, and everyone that's involved, um, bring us beyond a, a space where um, translation is all there is, right? All we're really worried about is giving people more information of making them science literacy, literate, and assuming that that will get rid of their fears, that will get rid of their concerns, and get rid of the things that they worry about about science. Because we know quite a bit now that it's not going to do that always, that there's more to what we live with and what science is to us than just having information about it. So in my mind, it's that space that I think we have to work to fill a little bit. Um, and that's what I mean by I say that translation is not bad. I think it's fully necessary, but I think it's only the beginning of the process of taking science seriously and showing the world and everyone um, how important it is and how it can also go awry at times. Okay, thank you. Hi there, I'm the project coordinator for Situating Science and I'm bringing up a couple of live stream questions. Um, Dr. Seco, this is from the West Coast, uh, spoke about the need to communicate his passion for science and its potential benefits to a broader audience. Dr. White spoke about the goal of educating the public. To what extent does the panel feel that a science journalist has the added task over other journalists, that of aiming to enthuse or engage a public possibly indifferent to science in a way that, uh, say, a sports journalist, uh, for example, doesn't need to? And do they think that, uh, let's say, um, evangelical fervor, fer fervor uh, to educate is necessary for the job. Um, the, second, the second question related to this is, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Seco, that your students whose interest in science is strictly professional, neither based in personal experience nor rooted in personal interest. Will these future journalists be well equipped to go beyond the media releases of government and other large corporations, purveying more and more of the public account of what science is and is doing? First thing is never ask two questions at the same time. <laughs> uh, I think it would be a very bad mistake to proselytize for science. That's the answer to the, my answer to the first one. My answer to the first one is you don't have to because people have an interest and there's always going to be an audience. 
Um, for my, uh, I'm trying to remember both questions. Um, for uh, my sense, um, in terms of education, um, it's a big debate in the field whether or not we should just be informers or educators or enthusiasts and things like that. I think each journalist wears a different hat at a different time, and I think the key is knowing when to wear which hat, when to be an informer, when to be an educator, and education can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. In terms of PR, yes, I think PR is one of the major things that a science journalist now has to deal with, um, especially with um, Eureka Alert and all these kind of other things that are in some ways are driving scientific agendas. So I hope that my students do come out of the program at Concordia with a very strong feeling for their own independence. Just not to forget that we're largely operating in an entertainment medium not an educational medium, if we're in the media. Yep. So the owner is, it's on the scientists to be better communicators, not the other way around, not the media to be... Oh, I wouldn't say that. I think <laughs> yeah. everyone, everyone could, could kind of benefit from doing a little bit of a better job, and I don't know where the onus falls necessarily, but I know as a journalist, um, I feel um, my onus falls on making sure the audience gets what they need and not that the scientists get what they need. And, and I certainly feel that, you know, if, if somebody doesn't come across in a story as being a good communicator, that's my fault as a journalist for not finding the right communicator and, you know, asking the right questions. Thank you. So um, I write for something called curiosity.ca. I'm a professor. Um, love this. Love talking to kids. Love going to schools and talking to them. I want to know what science communication we can do for teens because the latest survey, Angus Reid, says only 4% of teens think scientists are cool. <laughs> Probably only 2% of adults think they're cool. <laughs> Maybe we are uh, cool. <laughs> I, well, you know, inadvertently at Daily Planet, we are partly addressing that problem in that uh, we have a significant, we have, say, 35,000 kids under 18 watching the show every night, and I can tell you without... Uh, bragging that if I'm at a book signing, I was just at a book signing for a Daily Planet book a couple of weeks ago in the Edmonton uh, Space Science Center, and it was an endless parade of 14-year-old boys uh, with 12, -year -old, 12 and 13-year-old boys with their parents, 14 to 17-year-old boys without their parents, and the odd, and a few uh, teenage girls as well, and they absolutely love Daily Planet. They can't even sometimes articulate why they do. <laughs> But they think they think it's cool, and and I think that that is it's the pr thing I'm proudest of, because at that point in school, that's when interest in science starts to plummet. And there's a I would recommend an article in this month's American Scientist pointing out that uh, efforts to raise scientific literacy by uh, um, you know putting educational school educational programs on steroids don't work. Because 95% of the science learning happening in the United States, anyway, is happening outside of school. Where are the girls? Uh, well, you know, for some reason, girls aren't as interested in fast cars with rockets on the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the great things your program does. It gets scientists in front of the camera, too, because TV doesn't do that otherwise. And the TV shows, the CSI-type shows, don't show real scientists. I mean, women don't work in labs with low-cut dresses on. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, is that it for questions? Wow. One more question. Quick. We're, we're actually on injury time right okay. now. I'm going to lose all the context in this. But anyway, I had the opportunity to um, conduct a study, actually, on health, edu health, re health journalists and the role in knowledge translation, which isn't just about translating the the evidence in health, but more with regard to how they are, the context and how they're utilizing it and how the, perhaps the public's utilizing it. Interestingly, um, most of the researchers that I, or journalists I spoke with didn't feel that they had a role at all in this process, which is fine. But um, what I wanted to come back, that was just the context of what I'm coming up here. What I wanted to ask you was briefly, about the, well, quickly about the science media. You guys talked about developing a community. You guys talked about time so that there was, you know, issues about hyping a story, um, self-reflection, peer review. Um, what about critical thinking, the public and yourselves? Will that be lost in something like this? I think it's a great service. It sounds like a great idea, but isn't that what journalism's all about? If, 
if the Science Media Center stops journalists from critical thinking, we're in a very bad boat to begin with. Um, I think the, you gain those skills and use them without this. is um, I see it as an important tool for helping journalists map a very complex, detail-oriented um, field in Canada and knowing who to talk to when and helping to do that. And I don't think they push in any direction towards getting journalists to, to, to buy into their stories one way or another. What about encouraging more of that specialty, though? I mean, health education is a very, I mean, I have a spe health background as well, so it's a very specialized area. Evidence is, can impact the public, so there is a little bit more involved with regard to another beat. So, sorry, like in the sense of getting people more involved? Encouraging, in encouraging more of a, a perhaps specialties with regard to the, the journalism world, and, and maybe you know, having health journalists or, you know, having a certain level of understanding with regard to research in that area. And, and also having a greater, Susan Denser out in, in the U.S., she commented about how, you know, journalists should be starting to reflect much more with regard to their impact in the greater community. So do you feel like that's happening? Well, because I know we're over time, I'll say one thing, um, and I come back to the H1N1 pandemic. This is the first time I've ever seen, um, in my recollection, the media be self-reflective um, as their reporting was going on, with reporters reflecting on how their coverage was affecting other coverage. So I do think that's building, and I do think this is on everyone's mind in terms of how we can kind of go towards this. I think you'll see more of this coming out of the uh, MS liberation therapy story too. I think th I think there are some journalists starting to say, "What have, what have we done?" Okay, thanks. Uh, I think this panel deserves a uh, fantastic. <laughs> Well, I don't know what I can say. I'm neither a scientist nor a journalist. And uh, what I can take away from this, though, is that nine out of 10 Canadians change their behavior as a result of what they've heard in the media. Um, I can take away that uh, we have an insatiable appetite for learning about science. And I, not being a scientist, I think that's absolutely true. Um, we learned about needing to eat our food. And, and, and for me, not being a numbers person, I learned about needing to learn about numbers. <laughs> and women not wearing uh, low-cut dresses in labs. Um, but what I'd like to actually, I'd like to take away, and I hope the rest of you do, is that we've had, um, had a, a very uh, interesting conversation here this evening. Uh, I think it's been entertaining. Uh, which is not what I had anticipated taking away tonight. Um, I think it's been very informative and I think uh, it's been a stimulating discussion and uh, one that we'll be able to continue um, in a more formal way after the conclusion of this evening and I'll tell you about that in a moment. Um, so with that, I'd like to present our uh, panelists and uh, Jay with a small token of our appreciation which has been has been donated by the uh, Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation, and you see the, uh, the banner here. Uh, the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation is one of our sponsors this evening, and uh, with that, I'd like to present you each with one of our gifts. Oh, I hope it's funding. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke several times earlier this evening about the visionaries behind the Science Media Center and uh, one of those visionaries, and in fact, uh, somebody mentioned earlier to me uh, today that uh, she was not so much a visionary as actually a guiding light, um, and that is Suzanne Corbet, who uh, has just stepped down as the founding chair of the Science Media Center. And in her spare time, Suzanne is the principal of Corbet Consulting, which she launched in 2009 after serving as the Vice President of Ex External Relations and Communications at the Canada Foundation for Innovation, which I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with. 
Uh, Suzanne is currently engaged as the Director of Global Outreach at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, working to build mathematical capacity in developing countries. She's been a key player in advancing the public agenda in science and technology and in building strong relationships with governments and among a variety of partners. And I'd like to invite Suzanne up to uh, just speak a little bit about the importance of partnerships and just how the Science Media Centre will rely on all of us in this room and many others to, uh, to be a success. Suzanne? Thank you very much. Wow. This has been the most amazing evening for the Science Media Centre, I think, since its launch. Now, please don't tell the rest of Canada I said that. <laughs> oh boy, it's being live streamed. Am I in trouble now? We noticed the momentum has built with every launch event and uh, I have to say that tonight is, without exception, has met our expectations and plus. This community and uh, the organizing committee for this have been just absolutely exceptional. Science and its publics, what a better marriage for all of the groups that partnered in making tonight a reality. And I thank the group for that title because there could be nothing better. Tonight was about a lot of P words, makes me kind of feel like I'm part of Sesame Street or something, but uh, it's about passion. And sometimes when I speak, people say, wow, Suzanne, you are so passionate. So I was going to come up and say what I lack in context, I bring in passion, but <laughs> I can't beat the panel on passion. I'm sorry. I'll I tried, but I can't. It's about partnerships, people, public engagement, and our fantastic panel. And all of that has brought together a really, really amazing evening. I think what I really want to tell you about is, is if, if you think of what you heard tonight, we heard a bit about who the Science Media Center is, who it engages, we've heard about what it's going to do and what it'll be, and I just want to give you a little bit about the how. How does it happen? Many of you will know that media is an organization that will shy away from any group who is owned or bought by any one entity. So the Science Media Center absolutely needs to be supported and owned by a very broad range of people so there is no perceived or real interest by any one party. And as a result, even the funding that keeps us going, we have what's called a 10% rule that no one funder can provide more than 10% of our operating costs because we don't ever want it to be perceived that the agenda that we help to put forward, um, and I shouldn't even use the word agenda because we bring we bring to the fore uh, information on agendas, um, that that was not influenced by any one person. So the fact that tonight's group, made up of several partners, uh, is, is present is really, really reflective of what the Science Media Center needs to do. Tonight's uh, group was made possible through collaborations, the very powerful collaboration of Situating Science and the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs. Fantastic organization, great partnership, and they collaborated from the very, very beginning, as Chris told you. The other people who participated in organizing tonight's event was Halifax Global, who you heard was a partner from the very beginning, and, and you know, Chris Hornberger was a little modest. She actually jumped to the, uh, the ask when I said to her, could you help us spark a little more interest and bring this truly to Atlantic Canada? Um, and she was very much a driving force, and thank you for that, Chris. Quantum Communications has been a partner for a long time. Dalhousie University, the University of King's College, and Nova Knowledge were all a key part of making tonight happen. But also, tonight didn't happen without a little bit of support in the real kind that we talk about that really make things happen. And Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation, as well as Genome Atlantic, are key partners, and their posters are up here, and we thank them very, very much for that. 
When this initiative was first launched, I mean, a lot of people ask me, I, like Chris, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a journalist, so what did I see in this and why was this idea so important for me to bring forward? It's exactly what was demonstrated today. People want to talk about science. They want to have good information to be able to engage in good conversation. And it's not so much about where you sit on the issues. It's the fact we're talking about it. And many of the people in my world aren't what we call the community of interest. Many of you are. I would guess that the majority of people in this room have a real interest and want to know more about science. And there's a lot of other people out there who don't even know they want to know more about science, and we hope that the Science Media Center will help bring that forward. So this partnership, we hope that we'll be able to increase by having members and charter members and patrons from Atlantic Canada, good researchers participating in this, the journalistic community, active partners, and together show that this truly national service that is virtual, and even though we may have a couple staff you know, in Ottawa who are helping somebody in Montreal, as the, in, the group grows, this is a virtual organization that is meant to represent the whole of Canada. And so what I'd really like to say is that even though they said at the beginning that Atlantic Canada isn't competitive, uh, I think maybe you've won the competition and you've set the bar for the rest of Canada for launch events. Thank you for the very, very warm welcome um, and we hope that this service will be as valuable in Atlantic Canada as it is in the rest of Canada. So thank you very much for having us here. Thank you, Suzanne. I have a very few just housekeeping announcements I'd like to make before uh, you can wander down the hall to the wardroom. Um, a reminder to complete your evaluation forms, uh, very important for future events. Um, if this discussion is of interest to you, you should note that Café Scientifique is hosting an event on February 23rd at a local café to be announced. The discussion is titled Stories and Facts, How Should the Media Present Medical Science? And the provocative opening line in the abstract is, is the role of the media to present medical facts or medical stories? So stay tuned for the location. Posters will be around town. A reminder that this is the first of the Science and its Public's National Lecture Series. The next one is November 25th in Montreal. Um, but if you'd like more information on future events, and I think I heard there will be another one in Halifax... Uh, the websites are Situating Science and the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs. When you came in, you probably noticed a table um, on which there were piled a lot of black notebooks uh, with a silver stamp on them from the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation. We'd like you to take those notebooks, so please, when you leave here, take at least once and if, one, and if there are still lots there, feel free to take more. And lastly, you're invited to continue this discussion over refreshments in the wardroom, which is down the hall that way, I think. Follow the signs. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this evening. Thank you.